My name is Monty Clark. I'm co-founder of Abound alongside my business partner, Isaac Anderson. Wherever he is, you can wave. Um, we've created Abound events to help inform, educate, and discuss important topics for your business. So today's event is part of our technology series. We're very excited to have Morty Hackle give a wave, Morty, and Brian Sampson give a wave to us. Um, they're going to lead this fireside chat about the AI revolution and how it affects your business data. Okay. So Morty, just by way of introduction, is a co-owner of KJ Technology. Morty's worked with many companies to help secure corporate data and implement technology systems. Brian owns 10 Forward Consulting, approaches technology from a development and engineering perspective. So they have, both of these guys have extensive knowledge between the two of them. I trust you're going to come away from this discussion with the insights and lots of things that you should be discussing internally with your businesses. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, I look forward to speaking about the AI revolution and the future of your business data. It's uh, really a pleasure to be welcomed by Monty and Isaac. They're wonderful folks that we enjoy working with very much. And my gratitude to you guys, my gratitude to Brian, and I appreciate everybody that helped put this together with me. Um, it always does take a village. Nothing ever happens on its own. So thank you. You know who you are. I appreciate you very, very much. I'd like to speak for a moment about why would anyone care about the fact that, you know, there's Instagram little feeds or TikTok feeds that say, ooh, there are 12 different AI things that can make your business much better. And most of them are about writing or pictures or video. And to at least somebody like myself who's born technology, those tend to be a little less relevant to my business. So why should I care about what AI is doing in the business? And the answer is, is really AI is already in your business. It's in every part of your business, not just because employees are using it to write copy or edit pictures or do other types of AI work, the data that's inside the AI applications is big business. So there are unique applications that are already being built for business and non-unique applications that are being used for business. That's legit business as well as criminal enterprise. And I'm not accusing anybody over here of being a criminal. I'm just saying that criminals do want to use AI in a similar way to be able to gather data, use data, and defraud people and make money. Um, for another time, we can have a conversation about the criminality of um, and the criminal enterprise about how, to, how, how criminals take and uh, get money from unsuspecting and even suspecting customers. So just maybe take a step back. Um, and there was a book written probably in 2014 by Nick Bostrom called Superintelligence. And he delineates AI into three different distinct phases. Specific task-oriented intelligence. An example there would be Deep Blue, uh, the chess master that in I don't know, it was the late 90s, I think it beat um it beat grandmasters in chess. And that was very specific because, I don't know, you know, I'm an old guy. So I remember that, it, you know, in the 80s, everyone said that chess was going to be the hallmark of artificial intelligence. It was going to exactly say that it was going to actually say that if you were able to master chess, that was going to be an AI. But in truth, what we've learned is just because Deep Blue was able to play chess really well, it was not able to think like a human and it was not able to extrapolate the knowledge or the moves from chess into human-like activities. So the next phase that uh, um, Nick Bostrom outlines is general artificial intelligence, which generally applies to human-like behaviors, things that human beings can do, which is essentially take knowledge and extrapolate it. Um, and then the last phase is superintelligence. Superintelligence was what I think, if you remember, you know, February, March, when ChatGPT came out, people were super concerned that ChatGPT can learn itself and, you know, leapfrog any intelligence, its creators, and, um, and, and start evolving in ways that no one can anticipate. So I would like everybody in the chat, please, to 
drop a number. One would be, you know, are we in the AI phase one of task oriented general artificial intelligence two or super intelligence? Based on your opinion, where do you think we are? Mostly people are saying one, a couple of 1.5s and uh, some two, okay? Um, so somewhere between one, one and a half, maybe two would be pushing it. I think that would be my assessment as well. Probably somewhere over here, if you could look at, and you can see my mouse, literally in between a specific AI that can edit my pictures and something that has the ability to take my instructions and then do something with it and then take that something and do something else with it. Let's assume we are at 1.5 and there's data that goes into 1.5 apps what kind of data would be going in there and where would it, what would people do with it? So let's think a little bit about different kinds of data that people would load into chat GPT. They'll upload potentially even PII data. They'll take a spreadsheet and say, please format this for me, write a pivot table or run some histograms information, other HR data that people wouldn't want into um, various other AI or HR specific um, programs. There was something that happened um, with recruiting probably about four or five years ago, where um, the AI for recruiting started focusing its recruiting efforts on a segment of the population that was more demonstrative of the people that were in the company rather than the people than, than a cross section of the population or people that they wanted. So just interesting things on where the data goes and what happens to it. Yeah, and contracts, agreements, risk, financial statements. If that goes into an AI, what happens with that data? That's probably up there already to some degree. Terms and conditions, investments, people are doing deals, designs, trademarks, copyrights. And from a business perspective, would you consider that to be okay? So... Unfortunately, and certainly as a technologist, I would say that there are more questions than there are answers. You know, are there limits? Can you block certain things from, I'm sorry, certain people or certain machines or certain environments from accessing certain kinds of AIs or AIs in general? Can you limit it? Can you block it? Can you monitor it? W what would you do in terms of governance? Is the, revenue, uh, is the revenue model of an AI company a problem for you? Can you share in said revenue? What about the training data? Does the training data come directly to uh, the AI companies because they're looking at public data? Can you opt out of that data? What about the legalities, especially once we start crossing into generation two and maybe even towards generation three? What about spoofing a web property? Can you inject a fake AI onto someone else's property, maybe like malvertising, and start collecting data under the guise of being an AI. And what does that mean to your business? What's the exposure from a reputation perspective? What's the exposure from a legal perspective? And are there programmatic ways to protect against these types of things? And lastly, and probably most importantly, which is kind of why I pushed it all the way to the bottom, is who owns all this stuff? Does it matter where you connected to it from? Does it matter where it is? Are, are, are all these things governed kind of like tax law, which they're making up as they go along when we all moved to work from home and no one can really figure out where anyone is anymore and what they're doing and the whole world is now virtual. So I don't have all the answers. I have some preliminary answers which I'd like to just mention from a governance perspective, I think it's time to dust off the policies that have probably been in place. And if they're not in place, they should be in place that talk about um, acceptable usage within the company and start adding in information about AI in there. Similarly with TPRM or third-party risk management, understand which tools you're using. Anecdotally, we at KJ did a quick audit of the number of tools that we have for frame of reference, we are at a uh, you know, um, couple handfuls of people right now, and we have over 45 cloud-based tools that we're using internally. Odds are you have tools that you should probably check to see what that company is doing. 
from a spoofing, monitoring, and blocking perspective, on the firewall side, Palo Alto just released a category into their URL monitoring and blocking for AI. I think they're the first. I'm not 100% sure, but I think they're the first. And, you know, obviously monitor the DNS, URL filtering, and certainly employee monitoring from a keyboard and mouse click and screen capture is an option. Consult your technology advisors. It's always important to ask, ask the people that are advising you how to manage for certain risks. And obviously, we are not financial advisors. We are not lawyers. Consult the experts in those fields. Actually, you know what? Before I move forward, I maybe wanted to ask Brian about the programmatic thing, because obviously, I'm not an application developer, more of an IT security and an IT infrastructure fellow. Um, are there ways to programmatically limit the way that um, some of these devices interact with my computer or any applications that I may be hooking into? Yeah, absolutely there are. So that's one of the big things that we're we're working with some of our clients on. We talk to them and we say, hey, have you heard of ChatGPT and what are you doing with it? And the most common response that we hear is employees are not allowed to use ChatGPT or any of these other AI services, these large language models on company resources, right? Like the privacy constraints and implications aren't understood and or they are understood and then people just don't want OpenAI or Microsoft or Google to have access to all of these internal resources. And so I think that all of the all of the press and all of the attention that that this type of technology has got this year has kind of overshadowed the way that AI has been used internally in data science for very many years, which is self-hosted, you know, on-premises or private cloud solutions like that. What was cool about this open AI stuff and ChatGBT and Dolly and all of these new things is how it brought, how it made all of this technology so much more accessible to people where previously you needed a lot of hardware, you needed a lot of, you know, very specialized people, you needed data scientists or machine learning experts in order to even have limited access to this type of technology. And now that it's the cat is kind of out of the bag, some of these companies, you know, for example, Microsoft just about a week ago launched a private Azure hosted uh, chat GPT open AI portal where you can upload your own data sets securely. You can fine tune these models so you can take advantage of all of the training set that they have from the greater internet, but then fine tune it to your use case in a way that doesn't share your data with the broader internet. And I just received beta access to that uh, yesterday. And so I'm excited to try it out on some of our internal customer service things, which we were reluctant to upload previously, you know, because it contains customer emails and customer communications. We don't want to upload that to directly to OpenAI, but if it's our own self-hosted Azure and we're paying for the compute resources, we're much more comfortable experimenting in that space. Thank you. So uh, Brian already mentioned Microsoft, um, Microsoft's philosophy on AI is it's going to be integrated into every application and every business process and accessible to every person. This isn't going away. It's not going away anytime soon. It's a question of how do you manage it? Google, um, there's a, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, maybe Duet, integration into workspaces. And as you know, Google screen scrapes everything. Brian spoke about that earlier. Training the AI is an incredibly difficult, time-consuming, and expensive way, uh, and, and an expensive endeavor, rather. So how does a company train on data that it doesn't have access to? Some have been a little bit more forthright about what they're doing, and others have less. Um, a funny story is that um, in the Australian Financial Times, I think it was, they said that Google wrote a letter to the Australian government telling them that they need to relax their copyright protection laws so that they can go ahead and screen scrape data that was otherwise protected. It's just funny because I think Google, whether they're doing it legally or illegally, I certainly have no insight onto. But I know that when I, you know, am talking about something 
the ads immediately start showing up in my email and my G Suite. I'm assuming that they're either recording me through my phone or they're somehow capturing the information anyway. So I wouldn't put it past any company to screen scrape. And another example would be, uh, you know, Salesforce as Einstein. They're adding in interactions for sales, service, marketing, and so on. So a quick recap, enormous opportunities. It's not going anywhere. Rich data creation capabilities for somebody who didn't necessarily have the ability to have contextual thinking about the issue and all the ramifications of you can plug that into an LLM and get some ideas on what you need to think about. Speed to create. If I'm trying to build something, I can build it much, much, much more quickly. I think the stats from Microsoft are their programmers are about 70% more efficient at this juncture. And obviously, easier access to analytics, decision support tools, and so on. Um, there are many, and I can share some links on some purpose-built AIs for business that people might find interesting later. Obviously, weaknesses would be uh, reliance on AI hallucinations. If you're asking for a business support case from an AI and the AI hallucinates, are you just going to move forward? What happens if the AI leaks data, both internally or externally? It may leak salary information if asked properly, or if uh, you create a Dan-like personality, I don't know, what are they up to, 11 or something like that? for chat GPT. So there's another personality that can fool the AI into divulging information that otherwise needs to be permissioned or segmented away. Obviously we spoke a little bit about the cost of training and ownership. So all those things are uh, important to think about. From our side, I think the recommendations are fairly straightforward and they don't really change much um, in terms of your business strategy. You really need to consult your technology and security advisors. Uh, also, of course, your lawyer. Not, not me trying to like pitch lawyers, but uh, they, they do have a lot of valuable insights to help you protect your business. So develop an internal um, governance model. If you have it, review it. Make sure your policies are defined, your guidelines are defined. The data classifications, what data should and should not be available to a public AI versus a private AI. Let's say, you know, um, as Brian mentioned, you subscribe to a private AI. Can you use that? And the contractual agreements that you have with said uh, vendors. And that obviously drives the whole third-party risk management. If you don't have it, please develop it. At KJ, we work with many clients on this. So if you need help, by all means, we're happy to help. And if you have it, review it. Make sure that your data security classifications are set up properly. You're asking the vendors how they handle data, how they deal with privacy, how they deal with compliance, transparency, reporting, contracts, and financial incentives. And, you know, it may not be a bad idea to look at their reviews and see what the community thinks about them. Are they honest? Are they forthright? How do they make things right when things don't go right? Which they inevitably do. So overall, at least from our perspective, nothing changes in terms of the business thinking, but it does need to be made more relevant to the current tools that are out there. Thanks, Marty. Appreciate it. Love to hear. One thing from the group, everybody that's on the call, how many of you have policies and guidelines already established within your companies? Drop into the chat. Let us know if you have that. Do you have data security guidelines that you're working with within your companies? Morty, if you want to back up a couple of slides, if you don't mind, to the question screens. For everybody that's on the call, if you have questions, feel free to hold them if you want to. Um, also, feel free to drop them into the chat. We'll have these guys discuss them as well. But you know, from my standpoint, we have um, with so many tools that are coming out because I'm a tech guy, I tend to keep track of all kinds of new tools with this AI tsunami, if you would, that's come. And I've got almost 500 different AI tools in various categories that I have been monitoring and watching. How does a company keep track of everything that's coming out and what their employees are using and what their employees are not using, because it's easy to say block chat GPT, but what do you do with the rest of the stuff, even as they're coming out? And, and a lot of them, you may want your employees to um, use, right? 
you may want them to your sales team to be using some sales tools. You mentioned Salesforce and what they're doing, but there's all kinds of other ones. Your marketing team may be wanting to use some AI. They're, those do all those plug in basically to the chat GPT system? Are they carved out from uh, where they live that so they're not integrated into the sea of data that chat GPT is scraping? Can both of you guys speak to that a little bit? I mean, it's all over the place, right? Like it, it's, there's so many different tools that are either based on either the same technology or like chat GPT or other open AI products specifically that it's, it's very difficult to tell. So for example, at our company, you know, really the only way that I've found to manage this kind of stuff is through policy, not through technical controls. You know, like we require employees to use our, um, like our single sign-on for everything that they use. And so OpenAI, Azure, like they all have single sign-on access. And that way, at least, you know, you can kind of track behind the scenes administratively. But, you know, if people are going off signing up for, for different, you know, some of these websites that they see on TikTok, there's really not much that you can do, at least from a technical standpoint, other than enforce policy and make it clear that that's not acceptable use, like any other unacceptable use of work resources. Brian, can you explain what a single sign-on is? Oh, sure. So we use uh, Google's G Suite for all of our email and office and everything. And so we have a policy that if you if you want to go sign into, you know, for example, OpenAI, they have a sign in with Google button. And so our policy is if a website has the sign in with Google button, use the sign in with Google button. And then when an employee leaves, it's very easy to automatically terminate all of their different subscriptions to different third parties. Whereas if they just signed up with username and email and password, it's like impossible to keep track of that. Good. Yeah, Marty, Mickey, do you have but, anything to add? Yeah, I was going to just say that I, I kind of glossed over this at the during the presentation, there are two ways to monitor for activities that you don't like at a company. The first one is through through categories in either URL filtering, DNS filtering, essentially blocking the ability to get to certain sites either on the computer or through the firewall in the network. As I mentioned, Palo Alto had a category created for artificial intelligence that you can, if you're being um, serviced by Palo Alto, can block that category. Those things are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but they generally tend to block many of the services within a category. So if you're blocking hate speech, it doesn't mean that all hate speech gets blocked. And if you're blocking, you know, gambling sites, not all gambling sites get blocked. So I would imagine similarly here would be the case. Obviously, I have not yet tested that personally. So it's just from what I've read. The second way of checking on people, and again, this is much more Big Brother-esque, but it is literally watching what people do on their computer. And certainly over COVID, that has become a little less taboo in the sense that companies are a little bit more comfortable ensuring that their employees are in fact working. And in so doing, they'll check that they're typing on their computer, moving their mouse, and they will get screen captures from their, their screens. Now that is can be done to varying degrees as well. And the question really is, to what degree are you comfortable getting into people's business, so to speak? Um, and how much is governance, how much is trust, and where does your company fall down? Where, where does your company fall in that continuum? From that first slide, when you were talking about where we're at, and we had everybody put where they thought, we most of us said we were at stage one. How quickly do you guys feel we'll be approaching stage two? You know, when we look at the internet, how long it took different platforms like Twitter, LinkedIn, all these things, they hit a million users. When AI appeared, you know, they had a million users in like three hours or something crazy like that. And now with so many people using it and quote unquote training it and everything else, what's your perception? Where do you feel where this is going? How quickly are we moving into that general artificial intelligence can apply, you know, human intelligence stage? Yeah, I think the Brian may have a little bit more of a programmatic knowledge here, and then, then I'll I'll give you a little bit more anecdotal in a minute. Well, I was interested in what it and what you had to say, Morty. I I think we are a long way away from artificial general intelligence. 
I think the the technologies that we have right now, especially the LLMs, are very impressive technology and when applied to specific business problems can be, you know, can cause a huge amount of efficiency gain. However, I think that we're a long way away, years, if not decades, from general artificial intelligence, just because the the current way that we're iterating on these in the technology community is going to start hitting a wall where we can only feed so much data at it. And the current way that our models are limited is how much data they can consume. And what we're looking at with ChatGPT 3.5 and 4 is they've basically consumed all of the data that you can. They've read the entire internet multiple times. And until we find a way to either dramatically change the way that the models are architected under the hood so that they can really do their own actual thinking um, or find a way to pipe more data into them, I think it's a long way away still, which may be a controversial opinion. It's funny. That's pretty much where I was landing as well, meaning from a learning perspective, if you're learning what is and you don't have the ability to innovate, and I do recall that there were some articles back again in the um, in the March or February timeframe that were illustrating that GPT was able to actually learn and extrapolate again, whether or not they were able to replicate that, whether it was able to do it continuously, whether OpenAI changed the underlying code to stop that because people started freaking out or they were advised by, you know, uh, government or some other regulatory agencies that this is a bad idea. I couldn't even begin to speculate. But at least as of today, it doesn't appear that the machines have the ability to extrapolate. So if I know something, then I know something and I can predict it with generally faster ability than humans can. I can consume it. I can process it. I can output it in a better way than a human being can. But I don't have the ability to develop knowledge from a different set of knowledge. I don't have the ability to um, apply. I don't have the ability to truly learn. I certainly don't have the ability to extrapolate. And and that's my opinion. I am not a machine machine learning scientist. <laughs> um, you didn't GPT that? I, I, so... well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Maybe I did a little. <laughs> but I want to start opening it up to um, our audience here too. If you guys have questions, please raise your hand. Isaac, you can monitor that for me because I can't see everybody. Morty, why don't you go ahead and we can stop the share on that. We can ask, have some people ask some questions. I'm going to jump into a couple of questions that we have in our chat. I'm sorry, I don't know how to say your name, but the question is, are there any known AI related regulations coming down the pipeline for either federal or state governance? I'll, I'll take a stab based on everything that I've read. The answer is yes, but the answer is also they don't really know how. So um, I, I'd go back to the in super intelligence book. It's dense, but I highly recommend that for anybody who is even peripherally involved in this business because it really breaks down the different phases and the different concerns and what could happen and how to start thinking about Again, from a regulatory perspective, I think the answer is yes, but I don't even think anybody has the ability to understand how to regulate something that is technically smarter than you. Brian, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I would agree that certainly there's been discussion about it and it's been impossible for pretty much anybody to ignore all of this technological advancement this year. And that includes our elected officials. Um, there was a very prominent group of researchers and technologists who signed an open letter calling on all of these AI labs to pause their big experiments, saying that we don't need anything more powerful than GPT-4 right now until we can understand it a little bit more. And so what they're calling for is a six month hiatus on training larger models than GPT-4, whether or not folks like Microsoft and OpenAI and Google will listen to that is up in the air. But certainly it got the attention of a lot of technologists and it got the attention of a lot of regulators and it's certainly being discussed, you know, now how quickly they're going to pass anything to enforce some of these limits is your, your guess is as good as mine. Got a really good question for Brian. What should you do when you didn't realize private information was publicly available on one of your web properties that data was fed into AI training data 
by a web crawler and now it's out there forever. Can you protect against that? Well, so those are kind of two different questions, I think. What can you protect against that? Absolutely, you can protect against that. What should you do when you realize it? Um, I don't want to say you should panic, um, but you should probably follow whatever is in your process for a data breach. Um, you know, hopefully if you're a, a company of any size and experimenting with this type of thing, you have policies and procedures around when data is breached and how you disclose that to your customers and to your vendors and to your partners. And so that would be my recommendation is as soon as you realize that this data has been breached, because I think you're correct that that is now out there forever, there is no undo button on the larger internet. And so you just need to follow the standard breach protocols. Okay, we have another one that come in. Do you have any concerns about third parties uploading your business data to an AI system without your knowing or consent? Accountants, contracts, email history, QuickBooks, CRM, online purchase history, et cetera. Can you protect yourself against business liabilities from third parties in any way? Wow, that's a big question. I think once you start getting into business risk, if you have a program and you're being thoughtful about it, then that's a really, really good start and bring in the right people to have that conversation. Because if you're being, if you're doing um, the best that you can, then no one's going to really necessarily fault you for that because you can't foresee what you don't know and you can't deal with an unknown. But if you do have a program, that's good. And if you don't have a program, then you really should have a program. Is it more about if you have a program, you're at least showing that you're actively trying to put up a wall in some way to protect yourself against liabilities from information being stolen? Or is it just simply about, well, we tried? I think it's a little bit of both, personally. Meaning, obviously, you need to do your best, whatever the hell that means, you know? By developing a process around that, that shows that it wasn't something that you did willy nilly, but there was a little bit of a, there was a little bit of a plan. There was a little bit of a thought. Somebody developed, um, somebody went ahead and actually audited what you were, what you were using, even if it's anecdotal and asked people questions and checked, well, what data are you uploading into the web? What um, what systems are you using that are above and beyond what you know Brian knows through his SSO or people signed up through on a corporate credit card or their or their own credit card um, and they're using it for business purposes? Meaning, what's to stop anybody from taking confidential data and just dropping it into ChatGPT? And the answer is not a whole hell of a lot. Well, I know now you can upload documents and stuff to ChatGPT and some others that are coming along. So what happens when employees take those documents? Maybe there's legal documents and stuff that they're wanting to um, get ChatGPT to stream down or to give them the, you know, the basics of it. But now it's all sucked into that atmosphere. So yeah. what can you do in terms of a policy standpoint for your employees in taking data and uploading data? Writing a policy is easy. The question is enforcing said policy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the question is, and, 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 and th this to me, at least from my perspective, comes back to how do you manage your internal staff? Meaning, are we, are we concerned that people are untrustworthy? I think in most companies, the answer is no. If I tell them not to do things, unless they make a mistake, they generally will be fairly in line with whatever the guidelines or the policies are. Um, so the question really is, what exactly am I protecting for? Am I protecting for a bad actor? And if that's the case, then, well, at least to my knowledge, as a technologist, I've been doing this for 25 years, it's almost impossible to protect against bad actors, internal bad actors. Some of this is you could have to show good faith effort like we spoke about a couple of minutes ago, but some of it is really trying to think through where the exposure is and educating the team, say to them, here's what you can do. And here's perhaps what you've not thought of in terms of the exposures that can befall the company. To me, education mm -hmm. still comes back to being a lot of a, a big silver bullet. 
you know, if you trust your people and they're good people, they really want to do the right thing, which I believe is most people. No, I would agree. I would agree a hundred percent with Morty there is you have to trust your people. I would say the, the one thing I would add to that is, you know, when all of this chat GPT stuff came out and people read the news and they hear about all this cool new technology, if they're hearing about it from the media first, before they're hearing about it from IT security or from their boss or from HR, they're going to be so excited. They're going to be like, wow, this is cool. This is going to save me so much time. My boss is going to be so happy that I get my work done quicker now. And they're just going to go use it. And they're still operating in good faith, but you need to have that discussion with them. And I would, the, the other thing I would add is if you are going to begin allowing employees and yourself to experiment with this type of technologies, I would highly recommend not uploading any data anywhere that you're not paying for, right? So under no circumstances should anyone at work be uploading things to the free version of ChatGPT, right? Say what you will about the paid version and how much you trust OpenAI. You know, we at our company have chosen to trust Google for better or for worse, but that is a, a policy decision that we've made at the management level. But at least at the very minimum, if you have some sort of business vendor relationship with these companies and they have a data breach, they have certain obligations and you can go after them. Whereas if you're just clicking on TikTok and uploading company documents to the latest and greatest tool, there's nothing you can do. Yeah, and Brian, I just want to comment on that for a second. I read somewhere very recently that if you are using a product for free, make no mistake, you are the product. 100% agree with that. Sure. Okay, last question. We're bumping up against time. Um, but can the government request your data, business or individual use, input into an AI application be handed over to that AI company? I'll say the government can request and get pretty much anything it wants. Um, maybe that's my libertarian side that's coming out over here, but I will I will argue that I, I, I fully anticipate that as these tools become more pervasive there'll be more direct integration into government, both from a compliance standpoint and an adherence standpoint. So I, I think, um, I believe it was Isaac who mentioned it to me when we were talking about this the other day, or maybe it was you, Monty, I don't remember, but um, you know, the idea of you filing your tax returns and the government using an AI model to verify that you are doing what you said you were doing. You know, Can the government now go ahead and subpoena you or audit you based on what you did that they were able to literally audit on the spot, on the fly, using AI. I think these are just fascinating questions. And some of this is maybe not yet here, but within a few years, probably within the, you know, by the end of this decade, I would think some of these things will be generally available. Sorry. Well, thank you. Brian, no, you're, say something you're right. No, I, I agree with the same thing. We don't need to get into a whole big government. If, you, if you're interested in what the government can and cannot do with data they either request or don't request. I highly recommend the Edward Snowden book from a few years back. Um, it's an excellent mm. read and it, it kind of really gets into the details of what the government can and will do regardless of if they're requesting things. So I think that's one more reason to make sure that you're keeping your data private and that you're keeping it under control, not necessarily for the government, but for all of the other kind of people who are looking, people who might have sneaking eyes. Excellent, excellent insights. Marty, Brian, thank you very much for leading our conversation today. Thank you guys for joining us today. Um, this is going to be an event series. So next month we will host another event like this. It'll be another topic, but it'll be centered around technology and very important for your businesses. So look for that again next month. We'd love to have you join us. Thank you so much. We appreciate you all.